All right, let's get started. So welcome and thank you uh, for being here today. Uh, and welcome to the Illinois EPA Office of Energy, Public Water Infrastructure, Energy Efficiency Programs webinar series. So this is the first webinar in our spring series uh, and we're thrilled that you could join us today. So please take a moment to say hi in the chat and let us know where you're coming from today. My name is Cassie Carroll and I'm a program director here at CDAC. And I work with Sean's, uh, Sean Maurer, who's our technical director here at CDAC to deliver this program to you all today. Um, before we get rolling, I wanna go through a couple of Zoom housekeeping things. Um, so please feel free to use the chat throughout our session today. Um, if you have ideas or experiences you wanna share, please use the chat to, to share those with us. I'll also be putting some stuff in the chat as we go through today's session. Um, please share your questions as you have them in the Q&A box throughout the presentation. We'll have a Q&A portion at the end of our session today. Um, also, this event is being recorded, so the recording and the slides will be shared later today or early tomorrow um, so that you can view the session if you'd like or share it with others that weren't able to be here today. Uh, we'll email both of those things out to you as soon as they're available. And of course, uh, CEUs are available um, as well as PDH certificates for this event. Um, the CEUs are coming from the Illinois EPA Bureau of Water. So never fear for those that have been on our sessions. We sometimes frequently have delays with our CEUs, but never fear, they always come through, just probably a little bit delayed. So no worries. And thanks for all of your patience uh, with getting those course numbers for you. As soon as we get them, we'll send you the course number and certificate for today's event. So we uh, Zoom Smart tracks who's shown up and who's attending today's session. So we'll get those out to you as soon as possible. So today, uh, our event focuses on the path to resilience, maximizing energy savings at wastewater treatment plants. So of course, you know, focusing on improvements that increase your plant's resiliency will ensure that your plant can return to function no matter what the emergency or issue arises. Energy efficiency measures contribute to resilience in especially in wastewater systems in several different ways. From designing your plant to be more efficient to producing energy on site, energy efficiency and renewable energy offers a greater level of protection uh, to the operations of your plant. So we have some awesome speakers today that are gonna talk about resilience. Here in a moment, I'll turn it over to our technical director, Sean Maurer, um, to give a basic overview of resilience. Then I will turn it over to Josh Stevens or Stetson uh, from the, he's the director of business development at D3 Energy. And then I'll turn it over to Josh Stevens, uh, the plant operator at Bloomington Normal Water Reclamation District to talk about uh, what's going on at their plant. And you'll be excited to learn about all they have going on. So thanks for joining us today, Stetson and Josh. Um, today's webinar will be about an hour and 30 minutes. We may wrap up early, but you'll still get uh, 1.5 CEUs for this event. Okay, really quickly, let me tell you about CDAC. So part of the Illinois EPA Office of Energy's program is um, run in partnership with CDAC, the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center, and the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. And here at CDAC, we just, our really main goal is to reduce the energy of footprint of Illinois and beyond. So we just really try to help facilities save money, reduce their energy costs, and connect to new technologies that'll help make buildings, systems, processes more efficient and effective. We also partner with the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, who's also housed here at the University of Illinois. And their mission is to encourage and assist citizens, businesses, and government to prevent pollution, conserve natural resources, and to reduce waste and protect human health and the environment in Illinois and beyond. So they, um, CDAC and ISTC are the folks that provide no cost assessments through this program to you. Um, and, and we provide and just help you find good solutions to save energy and money at your plants. So I'll turn it over here. Uh, and thanks, Bill. Bill's in the chat if you have any questions from ISTC. Um, thanks for being here, and we're excited to have them as a program partner. So I'm going to turn it over to Sean, uh, our technical director, to talk a little bit more about what this energy assessment program is and how it relates to resilience at the plant. So Sean, uh, please feel free to kick our session off today. All right. Well, thank you very much, Cassie. It's uh, so a little bit about our program with the EPA. Um, the Public Water Infrastructure Energy Efficiency Program provides no-cost energy assessments and technical assistance to potable water and wastewater facilities in the state of Illinois that are publicly owned and operated. Um, we'll 
work with you to schedule a site assessment. Once we've completed that assessment, then we'll develop a comprehensive report that'll go through cost of upgrades, estimated payback periods, uh, applicable incentives and funding sources to help you get those projects from the planning into the ground. Um, and then we also offer continuing education events like this one. Uh, so to apply for the program, sign up for an assessment, uh, smartenergy.illinois.edu forward slash water is where you can find a link. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, how to start uh, planning for resiliency, identifying measures through an assessment. Um, then we'll turn it over to our guest speakers to talk about some examples of resiliency projects, um, on-site generation, and uh, other things. Um, and then we'll discuss some potential funding sources as well um, as we go through some of the assessment uh, details. Um, so I'm going to kick things off um, just going over our energy assessments, then we'll turn it over to Stetson to talk about some uh, floating solar opportunities. And then Josh Stevens will talk about uh, constructed wetland at the Bloomington Normal Wastewater Treatment Facilities uh, and their experiences with that uh, system. So why complete an energy assessment? If you've got an older system, we can find opportunities for you to improve equipment, plan for capital improvements, uncover any potential for that facility. Um, and we can also provide operators the support they need to push their ideas to budgetary committees and advance projects that they wanna see done to improve their facilities. Uh, if you've got a brand new facility or you recently upgraded it, you gotta be thinking, well, it's all brand new stuff here. We're as efficient as we're ever gonna be. It's only gonna get worse over time as things start breaking down. We always find something left on the table, got budgeted out. Um, there's always opportunities and there's always new technologies that can improve on what's been installed. Uh, so we'll help you identify those things um, and help make your plant more energy efficient and that will contribute overall to its resiliency. Uh, again, to apply, um, there's initial application pre-qualification questionnaire at our website. Uh, that's actually um, smartenergy.illinois.edu forward slash water. Um, we'll contact you by phone after we've received your initial application, go over some initial details about your plant facility, gather some basic information, coordinate with you on gathering utility data so we can provide you an initial benchmark of how your facility is performing. And then we'll schedule the assessment and come out on site and walk through your facility, take pictures of all the equipment that you have on site and start developing ideas for how to improve that facility for you. And we'll also talk to you about what ideas do you have? What do your operators wanna to see to improve your facility? So what is resilience? Cassie touched on this earlier. Uh, it's the ability to cope with and recover from disruption and survive. Um, and resilience is a key topic now, especially with climate change. Uh, particularly for wastewater plants, we're looking at changes to high rates of precipitation, causing uh, high flow events into facilities, uh, power disruptions as we start having warmer weather. Grids are going to start having more fluctuation in power availability. Um, so it can cover things like power generation and storage, preparing for those flooding events and rainfall events, um, all the way down to just training and maintaining staff and um, keeping your processes going. Um, all of that contributes to the resiliency of your facility. Uh, and an assessment is an early step to that resiliency uh, projects. Um, benchmarking is going to let you know how much you're using and where it's being used in your facility. If you don't track it, you don't know where it's being used, you can't really reduce it. You can't um, manage what you're using if you don't know where it's going. So we can help you with that uh, initial identification. Um, and then we can start identifying opportunities for improvements. And we can prioritize those based on, typically in our reports, it's economic feasibility. We've got a seven-year payback that we try to target. Um, but we can also no make notes of it's going to have a really big impact on reducing carbon emissions or some other desired metric that you have for your facility. So again, those reports get targeted to what you want to see. Um, we can help you identify new technologies. There's always new stuff coming out to the market, um, improvements and advances. Um, so we can help identify those. We're always trying to research those and stay on top of those available technologies. And then we're also going to connect you to funding sources. The end of our report has a list of uh, available funding sources from low interest loans to grants to utility incentive programs. Uh, so we'll try to connect you with all those. We try to make notes of what specific incentives apply to your projects and direct you to those. And we also provide, after we've completed the assessment, technical assistance in applying for those. Uh, we can help you 
come up with calculations you might need for an incentive application or something along those lines. Always happy to help out. Um, so that's uh, pretty much an overview of what services we provide. Um, one of the things I wanna point out before I hand it over to Stetson is as we visit facilities and tour uh, around, we see a lot of plants have lagoons or polishing ponds or storm overflow basins. There's water on site where you've got a lot of open area there that could be put to better use than just having open water there. Um, so stealing a little bit of Stetson's thunder talking about floating solar there, but I'll hand it over to Stetson to go into some more detail and, and cover some sample projects. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you everybody for your time today. Thrilled to thrilled to be here and, and be able to share a little bit of what we've been doing. And as I see people saying hello in the chat, there are different names in the cities and uh, counties that I've seen that we've already talked to. So, so for some of you, this might be a little bit of, of a familiar uh, topic. But um, quick background on myself. My name is Stetson Chavijan. I'm the Director of Business Development for D3 Energy. We are a solar developer based out of Miami, Florida. Um, and, and what makes us a little unique is that we focus on something called floating solar. And so for some of you on this call, you might go, what in the heck is that? And the idea for today is to kind of just allow this to you know, get familiar with the concept and just make sure that you know it's a available tool in your shed to be able to, to, be able to use. Um, one of the things that we've heard, especially across water plant operators, is you know, hey, we've got these incentives and we've got these goals to go green and to produce solar energy, uh, but we don't have any land and we're either apprehensive to put it on our roof or we don't have enough roof space to actually make a true impact on our energy uh, needs. And so floating solar is just this new concept that's, that's, that's been growing rapidly in the, uh, the U.S. It's been uh, globally grown now for over 10 years, but it's this new concept of going kind of an alternate way to, to, to wrap your solar, if you will, right? And so today, I just want to kind of give you that concept. I want to show you a couple of case studies that we've done and just, again, kind of enlighten you as to a new option that you have in terms of going, in terms of going solar. So let me share my screen. Okay, everybody should be able to see that. Oh, am I still on? Did it boot me off here? No, it looks like you're still on and we can see your screen. So just okay. say don't okay. It just said Zoom unexpectedly quit. So I don't know why I keep saying that. All right, cool, great. So, Oops. Okay, now you're back. <laughs> we can't hear you though, you're on mute. It looks like Zoom logged you out and then logged you back in. So we love technology, right? <laughs> sometimes it's our best friend and sometimes it's really not. <laughs> All right, we see your slide, Stetson. All Can right, you unmuted, share the screen. We good now, Can everybody see that? Yes. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay, cool. I don't know what happened there about that. Um, so again, we are a solar developer. We focus on an, uh, a floating solar. You can see some of the different entities that we've built projects for over the last couple of years. Um, some major entities like the U.S. Army was one that we just did at, at their Fort Bragg base in North Carolina, uh, Comcast, the city of Orlando, Miami-Dade County. So a wide variety of different types of entities from, from commercial customers uh, to, uh, to uh, utilities, to counties and so on. Um, so the big question is what is floating solar? And easiest way I like to kind of explain to others is don't think of it as any kind of cutting edge technology. It's the same solar panels, it's the same wires, the same uh, you know, electrical equipment that you would use on any other type of solar installation. It's just an alternate way to rack it. So instead of putting it on the roof or in the ground, uh, we have a solution where you can go ahead and be able to utilize this, this system called the Hydrelio to put it on bodies of water. 
Uh, it's got a 25 year plus uh, lifetime on the system. The entire system is 100% recyclable. And there at the bottom of the screen, you can see the track record. This has now been installed in over 30 different countries, over 245 grid connected projects and over 1.2 gigawatts of power has been installed utilizing this system. So this is something that's been tried in every type of climate you can think of, every type of body of water you can think of. Um, so so this, is, this is a tried and, to, uh, tried and tested product. So here's kind of a breakdown of just what is the floating system. It's actually really, really simple. It's probably the first thing they'll hear when people come on site and see a project. It's comprised of two floats, essentially. You've got your main float, which is where the solar panel goes. You have your secondary float, which is there for walkways and buoyancy. And so almost like a giant Lego set, uh, the entire system is uh, put together on land, kind of fed out into the water and slowly built like piece by piece. One of the first questions we get when we start talking about this is, well, you know, what about the safety of it? I mean, is there a chance that, you know, we learned at a very young age, don't mess with electricity and water. So are you sure it's okay to do this? And so the way that we, we build our systems, uh, there's no hazard that exists where the pond can become electrified. The way that we wire our systems uh, in the event of any kind of short, the entire system would trip at the combiner boxes on the island. And so there's not a scenario to where power would be leaking into the pond or the reservoir. Uh, it's just something I like to cover because I know that one comes to people's minds pretty quickly. Uh, the installation, we, the floats are U.S. made. They're made ju uh, just outside of uh, Austin, Texas. We've got three manufacturing plants here in the United States. Um, and again, kind of going with the analogy of a giant puzzle, you're kind of building it on shore pieces by piece, floating it out into the reservoir, and then, and then connecting it to the anchors. The anchoring system, we do a variety of different types of anchors depending on the body of water. Um, one of the biggest things that we've seen with a lot of water treatment plants and wastewater treatment plants is a lined reservoir. So obviously the option of, of, of penetrating that liner is not there. And so we've done everything from a ballasted system to bank anchors. So it really just depends. And that kind of goes into the engineering and design. But uh, we've we've kind of seen every type of uh, soil condition you could think of and every type of liner condition that that is out there. Um, the other neat thing about our systems is that what we do is we'll take into account the lowest water level, the highest water level, and then we'll account for that in the mooring lines. So there'll be enough slack. And so think of like a, like a boat rising and falling with tides, very similar for this array. Our, our array will be able to rise and fall with uh, the water level variation. Um, there was a project that was done on, on a dam in Portugal where the water varied up to 125 feet at any given time. So if that project could be done, typically we can figure out anything on a, on a water utility side. Um, also, and not you guys have to worry about this, but we have to worry about this in Miami quite a bit. Uh, these systems can be designed up to a category five hurricane. So uh, very, very resilient to the winds. The panels are at a 12 degree tilt, which is a little bit of a lower tilt than a standard ground system. And so that reduces a lot of the wind load on the backside of the panels. And so we're able to accommodate some very high wind loads when we design and build these systems. Environmentally, so um, this is another one that, that we get a lot of questions on. A white paper was done by WRA, a third party consulting firm, prior to any of the California projects being approved. And for anyone that's familiar with California, they've got a pretty stringent process when it comes to you know, improving anything on, on, on bodies of water. And those were a couple of the main bullet points that came back. Uh, the biggest one being minimal adverse effects to any kind of wildlife species. Um, there are gaps in the floats that were intentionally created to allow you know, waterfowl, mammal, any kind of, uh, even a human that were to go underneath the array for, for whatever reason, they would be able to come up for air. Uh, and the entire floats are made of HDPE plastic. So think of, uh, think of like a floating jet ski dock, a very similar material to that. Um, if anyone's familiar with HDPE plastic, that's what you drink your water out of, that's what you drink milk out of. So it's a plastic that's had a lot of testing gone into it. There's no chemicals that will leach into the water, into the environment. Uh, and that last bullet point right there is a pretty neat one. This is drinking water compliance tested by the English Water Quality Center. And one of the flagship, flagship projects that were done in Europe was on the drinking water reservoir for the city of London. And that was a six and a half megawatt system done in 2016. Obviously, a lot of testing was done prior to that system being installed and post that system being installed. And there has been zero issues with that system on that drinking water reservoir. From a, no, 
from an O&M standpoint, one of the biggest things I just want to make you aware of is that these systems don't really need a lot of love and care. Um, you know, you're really looking at maybe once a year getting out there and having to clean the system. So it's not like you're having to access the, the island very often or routinely. Um, you know, a lot of the O&M costs that you typically will see with a ground system have to do with the land, mowing the lawn, fencing, security. So the neat thing with floating solar is all those costs get eliminated right off the bat. And so we've actually seen that the, the cost of our O&M is, is, is roughly about half that of a, of a ground system. These systems can go in cold conditions. Uh, we've got arrays all over the world, New Jersey, Sweden, Korea, that spend every winter frozen in ice. Uh, you can see some photos there of kind of what it looks like when the water freezes around it. Essentially two things happen. Either the ice will freeze around the array, kind of lock it in place, or the entire array will just sit on the frozen ice throughout the winter. Neither are a problem. Um, the only time we've ever had to kind of look into, you know, a little bit more logistics is if it's a river or some kind of flowing water where you'd have pieces of ice kind of crashing into the island. But for most of the, the water reservoirs that we'd be looking at for, you know, a water plant, you wouldn't have any type of issue with that. And then this is a pretty neat one that we've seen, especially for some of these water uh, bodies that, that would be at a water plant. Um, kind of the additional advantages of floating solar to the water quality benefits. So really two that we've seen, reducing evaporation, which depending on where you are in the country can be a really positive thing. And then, and then reducing the sunlight penetration, which then turns into uh, reducing you know, those unwanted algae blooms and vegetation growths and things of those natures. Uh, we're working very closely with the Department of Energy on a system we have in Florida uh, where they're able to kind of compare the difference between two ponds, one with floating solar, one with not. And those are two of the main things that they've seen already coming back from uh, a, a pond with floating solar. And then performance. So one of the neat things that we've actually seen from floating solar is what we call the cooling effect of the water. And so essentially the way a solar panel works is the hotter it gets, the less efficient it gets, the less energy it produces. And so because our panels are roughly 18 inches off the water, the cooling effect of the wind and the water uh, really keep our panels substantially cooler and in turn then really increase the efficiency of them. Uh, we've had two, we have two utilities in Florida that have been monitoring the, the production of their systems and they've seen anywhere from five to 15% increased efficiency uh, from from uh, like neighboring ground systems or neighboring carports. So it's a pretty big bump in power that we've seen, which is pretty neat. And then the cost analysis. So what I like to tell people is we're kind of right in the middle of what a ground system costs and what a rooftop system costs. So we're gonna be a little bit more expensive than ground. We're gonna be a little bit less expensive than a rooftop. So we're very, very economically um, you know, competitive with, with any kind of other solar installation. And here are the four points that we make that kind of push floating solar to even a better opportunity. You know, you, you obviously, you eliminate the cost of land or any kind of land prep, uh, the greater efficiency output we already referenced, lower annual O&M, and then some of those ancillary cost savings as well. And here's just kind of, that's probably a really small font for you guys there, but that's just a kind of list of all of the different projects throughout the globe. As you can see, Japan is where this like really took off about 10 years ago. And it makes a lot of sense. Japan's an island, very limited land, very expensive land, but a lot of inland bodies of water. Florida is a great, a great kind of, uh, you know, example of that as well. And so I think if you're in an area where you don't have land or your land's too expensive and you're apprehensive of putting it on your roof, you know, floating solar is really a, a, a great alternative to be able to, to accomplish your, your green energy goals. So what I wanted to do next was, um, See if I'm gonna stop share. Wanted to show you guys a couple videos of some systems that we've done just to give you some visuals. And I'll walk you through. So this is a system that we did on a wastewater treatment plant in New Zealand back in 2020 pandemic. Uh, this is just north of Auckland, New Zealand in Rosedale. Um, and this is just a cool, cool video that Vector are. We lost you again there, Stetson.
can always send the video out um, through through YouTube in the chat if it's if it's not working. Oops, can't hear you. You're, you're muted. Zoom's not being nice to me today. All right, let me try one more time. All right, so I'm not sure how much you guys heard. Can you guys see that now? Yep, screens up. Okay, so this is a wastewater treatment plant in New Zealand that we did a project for. This was the first flo a floating solar system of any kind in the country of New Zealand and the largest solar system of any kind uh, in the country. This is a 1.2 megawatt. <laughs> I think it might be a bandwidth issue trying to play the video and post at the same time. Yeah, we'd be happy. We'll send it out to folks as uh, after the session with the recording. And we'll wait till Stetson uh, gets signed on and out again. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can stop. Sorry. All right. I will, Cassie, I'll send you uh, those video links for you to share with the group. But um, so anyway, that's that's kind of our, our presentation. If you guys have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. Yep, we'll go over some of those in the Q&A at the end. But uh, right now we'll turn it over to Josh Stevens. He'll talk about the uh, uh, constructed wetlands out at the Bloomington Normal uh, Water Recovery District. All right. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, as you said, I'm the uh, superintendent of operations at the Bloomington Normal Water Reclamation District, and I'll be talking about our experiences uh, with different types of bodies of water uh, than Stetson. Just a second. There we go, everybody see that? You look good. All right. So this is the first time I've given this presentation, so I apologize if I stumble over it a little bit, um, but I wanna talk about something we've done here uh, at our treatment plant, uh, at our Southeast plant. It's been kind of a theme uh, for this plant is more of the nature area and kind of uh, the way our wastewater treatment plant uh, fits in with nature. So I'm talking about the constructed wetlands and how that uh, relates to our resiliency here at uh, Wilmington Normal Water Reclamation District. So constructed wetlands, um, just start with what are they? Um, they're wetlands that are designed, created uh, for providing advanced wastewater treatment. Um, so we use natural processes through them to reduce uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, primarily uh, through promoting vegetative and uh, biological growth. So ours are located at our Southeast Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is, uh, if you're familiar at all, it's uh, in a rural area that's south of Bloomington and Normal. It's about, uh, I'd say, four miles south of, um, south of there. And what we do at the district here is we use it for uh, our wetlands as a polishing step. Uh, after we've gone through our uh, final effluent, we uh, use it uh, to basically polish our final effluent from the treatment plant. So why did we consider constructing them? Um, in the early 2000, uh, during the construction of the Southeast plant, uh, when it was being, uh, it was developed on uh, or is built on undeveloped farmland, um, which presented opportunities to consider the uh, uh, additional treatment process, uh, which at the time was a, a low cost treatment. Um, and if you recall, if you were in the industry in the early 2000s, uh, there was a lot of talk uh, really going on about the uh, nutrient removal requirements. Um, and we saw that uh, building constructed wetlands for the 
uh, could be used for potential uh, nutrient trading, which was kind of a, a topic that was being tossed around. Um, where our plant went, it was built. It was a, we had adequate acreage. Uh, so we had room to put in the constructed wetlands. And then we really were keen on the overall uh, low cost uh, to treat the nitrogen and phosphorus. So here's an uh, aerial view of our southeast plant. Uh, it's a traditional activated sludge plant. Um, you can see right here is our headworks and, uh, and pump station. And then we pump up to our primary clarifiers, aeration tanks, uh, secondary clarification in this building. We have uh, tertiary filtration and UV disinfection. Here's our uh, digesters and solids processing building. And if you can pick it out, uh, right through here, uh, that's our final effluent channel, and it flows out this direction to, uh, in this area is our receiving stream, which would be the Little Kickapoo Creek. And in the picture here, you can see uh, some of our wetlands pictured. So, Originally, we built uh, two wetlands at the time of construction in 2005. We had one that was uh, 5.7 acres and one was a little bit smaller, 1.7 acres. And then uh, what we've done is a portion of the plant's effluent is diverted to uh, each of the wetlands. So it's split between the two wetlands and then the remaining effluent uh, flows down the channel to the creek. Uh, we maintained an operating level of one to two feet. Uh, we controlled that with a telescoping valve at the discharge point to the streams. And when we originally put it in, uh, we put in or we seeded it with uh, aquatic vegetation to help get things started. Prior to all this, uh, where these wetlands went in, uh, it was traditional uh, row crop agriculture. Uh, so we did try and uh, support the vegetation growth by seeding it. Uh, in this picture, we detect the, depict the uh, effluent channel. Uh, on the left and the right here are uh, inlet valves that control flow to the wetland cells. Um, in the center gated area is where the water falls out and into, goes through those valves, and then remaining water flows out to the creek. As you can see, around here, surrounded, it's a uh, quite a bit of a natural area. Here's another overhead view aerial. Uh, there's that effluent channel to Little Kickapoo Creek. Flows along here. Here's our smaller wetland and here's our larger wetland. On each have their own individual discharge to the creek. So how did they perform uh, after we got them in originally? Uh, really not quite as we intended or expected. Uh, after several years, our aquatic vegetation kind of floundered and never really flourished. Uh, so we scratched our heads, you know, what really went on here. One thing could be just since there's so much ammonia nitrogen removed by the plant that it's not readily available, which is preferred by aquatic vegetation. But really in the end, we determined that was not likely. There's other means for the plants to obtain nitrogen. Uh, considered that operating depth was too deep to adequately maintain aquatic veg. And then uh, what was, in the end, we were considering more likely is uh, the effluent from our plant was warm enough, which never really allowed uh, those uh, wetlands to really freeze over in the winter and then presented opportunities for waterfowl and, you know, burrowing animals or muskrats to uh, finish off what was in there, uh, eat the roots, et cetera. So in 2007, um, to our advantage, uh, there's some ad adjacent land that uh, came up for sale that was just south of our property here. Uh, and ideally it was for us, it was the property bracketed both sides of uh, the receiving stream creek. So that was, it was a really good opportunity for us to uh, seek uh, putting in additional wetlands, maybe to do a better job of what we already had. 
So uh, in order to do that, we contacted a constructed wetland specialist named Robert Cadlick uh, in 2009 and worked with him uh, designing additional wetlands. So ultimately the site that was chosen uh, was on the other, on the land that was on the other side of the creek. Um, but the way it was designed, uh, we worked it where uh, our original larger wetland, um, we would hold a, a higher depth of water, create more head, and then we'd be able to transfer the water across the creek uh, via gravity. And all we had to put in was piping and figure out the conveyance under the creek. Uh, so that was that was a good win for us. Um, during the design, we did a uh, a little bit more professional help with the detention time calculations, flows, and uh, proper operating depth. And overall, uh, back in the late 2000s, uh, the cost estimate was right around $250,000. Really, in the grand scheme of things, when you think of other treatments, uh, even these days, you know, with inflation, it probably would be pre pretty reasonable cost. So the design changes, uh, design three additional cells, two of them would be run in parallel, and then a final cell uh, would be in series to those two parallel cells, uh, designed for a shallower operating depth of half a foot to one foot, uh, and it would be controlled by adjustable weirs manually. And then with those cells, we added an additional nine and a half acres of wetland. To what we already had. And by 2012, our construction was complete. It took several seasons just to get it done. And here's an over, overhead aerial view of our additional cells across the creek. So here's the our receiving stream creek right around in here. And here's our two parallel cells and then the final cell. So uh, water come in across the creek into this main main uh, channel here and then be dispersed between the two cells and then finally out to the creek. So I apologize, it's a little difficult, a different aerial, but it gives you a, a, maybe a bigger picture of the whole, whole property. Um, so here's the plant, obviously. Here's the original smaller cell and larger cell, and then here's the additional cells that we put in, uh, and they cross the creek uh, right in here. And kind of, I'll just point out with this picture too, you can see that uh, with this property runs for the district runs here that I'm outlining. So we do have quite a bit of uh, woodland uh, and then some prairie over here and then some mixed prairie down here with the additional wetlands. So during the design, we uh, initially went with the three cells, but at the time, it was also designed for two additional cells to be put in in the future uh, that we have not done yet, I'll say. Uh, so here is the creek, the additional cells we put in, and then here's our two other cells that we, we could put in in the future. Uh, so, forecasted removal rates uh, in the summer was we were hoping for seventy to ninety-two percent, roughly, and then in the cooler months, thirty percent. Um, since it is a biological process that is really working here, uh, we're most efficient in the warmer months. So, really, the the key time uh, to see any uh, good treatment would be during spring, summer, and early fall. And then our forecast for phosphorus, um, 65 to 85%. And then really in the winter months, it really drops off if you're lucky, 10 to 20% during that time. I want to say all of this was based on a flow of half a million gallons per day or less, uh, which at the time came out to be about 20% of our uh, effluent that would be diverted through the wetlands.
after construction of the additional wetlands, we monitored for five years, uh, monitoring flow, temp, pH, dissolved oxygen, and then uh, we did samples for total phosphorus and for nitrate. Here's a photo of a sampling site. This is like a, it's a box with our adjust or basically a weirs that we can remove weir plates. And there's a box at uh, each effluent point of the three new cells. That's a photo of a pressure transducer that uh, we used to measure level over the final effluent weir, and then we used weir calculation to get a rudimentary, rudimentary uh, measurement of our flows through the wetlands, which at times was, uh, it's sometimes challenging getting a good measurement out of it, but we uh, we did get some decent numbers. Uh, overall, we were, we tend to meet, uh, on average, it's more like probably 0.3 MGD, you know, in a wetter spring or late spring, it's easier to push the water through, there's more of it, so then we can get up to that half MGD flow rate. So what did we what have we found? Really, uh, nitrate removal is really great. Um, in the summer months, we're consistently getting 90% uh, removal, which gets us down to 0.5 to 1 milligram per liter nitrate coming out of there. Uh, phosphorus, not as good, but it's kind of in line with what was estimated. We're right around 50 to 60% our effluent um, out of the out of them is. 0.7 to 1.5. Uh, going into the wetlands, usually our our effluent is about three, three and a half milligrams per liter. Uh, we've not converted over to phosphorus removal yet. Um, we're in the planning stages at the main plant right now to uh, to be uh, doing those upgrades probably in the next uh, couple of years. We're hoping breaking ground on that. Uh, probably by this time next year. So what did we learn? Uh, one thing is seasonal level adjustments are tend to be a little bit uh, something to pay attention to. We like to keep it shallow in winter months, allow for a good freeze uh, and when the weather permits, and then a little bit deeper in the warmer season, uh, give us a little bit more detention time. And then uh, one thing they do is uh, attract a lot of wildlife, which is good and bad. We get uh, a lot of various uh, types of bird species. Uh, and then we also attract several burrowing type of animals as well, uh, which has pointed out to us that it's good to build stable berms. Uh, clay or ripper at base will definitely impact the, uh, the burrowing animals we'll have on the berms, since we do have berms uh, between each butland and on the and surrounding them. Uh, flooding also at times has been an issue during excessive wet weather. Uh, not uh, too terrible, but it can uh, wash out some of your vegetation and do a little bit of damage to the, the berms and other structures as far as uh, the weir structures. Uh, one thing we do as a more of a maintenance item is we will completely drain uh, and let the wetlands dry up occasionally. So generally probably every three years we've done this in the late winter, uh, early spring. And then by springtime, we try and get them uh, put water back to them. And another thing to watch out that we've learned is uh, during low flow conditions, at times you can get a little bit of a, a low DO coming out of your wetlands due to the long detention times. So we do have a, a bit of a cascade effect out of that final final wetland to uh, induce some dissolved oxygen in that flow. So I want to show you some things we watch out for as we get the Beavers around, uh, they're they're attracted to our wetlands. They like to set up camp near our wetlands or 
uh, even in our near our receiving stream, uh, which generally doesn't do a whole lot of damage, but uh, they do tear up uh, some of the nearby trees that maybe we really didn't want brought down, but they decided we should. Uh, here's a photo of uh, after a flooding event, uh, we had a creek come out of its banks, flooded our wetland, and then it did a little bit of damage to the berm. Uh, really didn't take a whole lot to repair it. I'll just bring in a little bit of extra riprap or clay and build it back up. And then probably the biggest problem we've had is muskrats. Muskrats tend to set up camp uh, and they burrow between the cells, uh, which has at times caused short circuiting for us. Uh, so we've had a little bit of a cat and mouse game of repairing their uh, their holes periodically. So usually two or three times a year, it seems like we need to come out and do a little bit of a repair. It's or um, we let it go and then we'll we'll do a repair, like I say, when we drain the wetland and then do it in over the winter time. So some of the highlights, um, pretty obvious, I think, or should be, is it's it's a simple method that can be utilized to provide additional treatment of your nutrients. Um, and like I said, especially in warm weather months, it does a, a real nice job. Um, it's low cost, really, in the grand scheme of it, to even uh, to construct them and then also to maintain and operate. We've had them in since, uh, really, since 2005, and our budget for them annually has been less than 20000 per year. I mean, easily. So that's it's not too difficult for cost. Um, really, only what weekly site visits needed. Uh, really, it's just to check your weirs, make sure nothing's hung up on them, or check the flows through the cells. Uh, sometimes if you see reduced flow, it's a good indicator that, hey, we got uh, muskrat burrowing, short circuiting, or something else is going on, a valve is plugged somewhere else. Uh, and then after monitoring for a couple seasons, it's you know apparent we really you only need to, if you're going to monitor it, uh, just to see how your efficiency uh, efficiencies are, it's during the warm weather months, um, that's when you're gonna do the best. Uh, I like to, Point out though, be sure the effluent from our wetlands is not, um, that's not on our, our permit. So we're not required to meet any effluent uh, numbers with that. This is just sole polishing of our final effluent uh, to achieve a, uh, a better reduction in our um, nutrients since we don't have, or prior to this, uh, had any nutrient treatment for phosphorus or nitrate. Uh, additional benefits, uh, it's a great enhancement to our existing natural areas. Um, there are areas that we have uh, at this site uh, that we do allow public access to. Um, so they are able, we do have a few trails, so they're able to walk uh, out to them, they can walk out to the wetlands, um, and it's a great uh, great area for people to, uh, if you're into birding, um, there's all kinds of birds out there and it attracts them. Uh, a lot of migratory birds come through, uh, attract various other aquatic species, amphibians, et cetera. And then really it's just good public relations um, to have. I think the public really appreciates it as a, Kind of a more natural treatment process. So with that, that's the highlights of our constructed wetlands. I'm sure there's questions I could probably answer too. All right, thank you, Josh. Appreciate the overview. Yeah. Cassie, I believe you've been collecting the questions in the chat and stuff. You want to start working through some of those? 
Sure, let me get unmuted here. All right, so thank you so much to both of our speakers. Uh, very interesting presentations and different takes on resilience. Um, so I think the first question, and Stetson, you might have answered this already, but the first question was, doesn't all the motion waves wind loosen the connections and bolts? Um, have you seen that before? How do you, how do you address that? Yeah, no, yeah, great question. So our, our default setting, if you will, is, is three and a half foot waves. So, so as long as we're not dealing with anything more than three and a half foot waves, which in the case of these inland bodies of water like this is very, very rare, uh, there's no issues there. The entire system, going back to that kind of Lego analogy, because the system is very uh, modular and each floats connected to each other, it, it, it rides with the wave action uh, very well and you don't have any kind of loose connections like that. Great, thank you. Um, and another question for you, Stetson. How does a photovoltaic system installed on a body of water affect the body of water in terms of urban heat island effect or evaporation? Yeah, great question. So it really depends on on a lot of factors. You know, uh, the depth of the water, the water temperature, um, what percentage of the the reservoir we cover. Typically, what we will do is try not to cover much more than about 75% of the body of water. We've seen as long as we stay underneath that percentage, we won't impact anything like O2 levels, water temperature, things of that nature. Um, and kind of going to that, that the uh, gaps in the floats that I referenced earlier, although from like a aerial site, it looks like it's a solid tabletop. If you were to take the panels off and actually just look at the floating system, it's more of like a giant checkerboard. So although it might look like it's covering a lot of the reservoir just from the island, it's actually more of a checkerboard type of uh, setup. Okay, great. I've got more questions for you. <laughs> Bring them on. Um, do you know if there's, have you worked with the Illinois EPA to do any permitting in Illinois? Have any installations been done in Illinois? I know there was a question around permitting and placing them on a lagoon. Yeah, we have not. We've worked with the EPA actually very closely uh, at their headquarters in North Carolina. We're actually doing okay. a project for them at their own lake there. So they're very familiar with floating solar. We've not done a project in Illinois to date. We do have two projects that are currently in uh, in uh, the kind of engineering phase in Ohio. Okay. Um, so very tight, similar setups there. Uh, for the most part, what we've seen on these man-made bodies of water on, on a permitting process is really ju just an electrical and a building permit. Mm. Uh, you know, if you're starting to get into more natural lakes and things of that nature, then I think you would start to see a little bit more of an environmental uh, questions in, in, in red tape. But on these man-made bodies of water across the board, we have not run into any projects where permitting has become an issue or cost prohibitive. Okay, that's great. And I think you answered this question about icy conditions, um, you know, and what affects it, but do icy conditions impact the efficiency of the panels in the system? A little bit of a different question. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, and that's a very good question. Um, I would say that in, in that regard, there's no difference between any type of solar installation. So, so you know, whether it's on water or on a roof, uh, sure. obviously, you know, lack of sun, wintry conditions is going to affect the, the production of the system but mm -hmm. that's all kind of accounted for when we do like our analysis and our energy forecasts all of that's uh, kind of baked into what you're expecting the production to be that's great and I know especially when the you know when the sun comes out and the snow starts melting that's when production goes back in the swing again <laughs> exactly. great um we had a question just about um you know, keeping the panels clean. I know the rain, we get plenty of rain here in Illinois, mm -hmm. or we have, um, that could keep them clean. But have you heard of anybody um, using a, like a power wash or rowing out to wash the panels at all? Or do they need to be washed or maintained yeah, we, in that way? It really depends. I mean, there, there are certain sites we've seen where there's a lot of bird action. And so you've mm -hmm. got a lot of bird droppings and things of that nature. Yeah, um, bird island, so, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've actually used like laser deterrents that kind of keep birds off of the arrays as well. But in terms of cleaning, uh, we say it's on an as needed basis, which at the most I've ever seen is is about two times a year. Mm. Um, most of our projects in Florida where same thing, we get a lot of rain down here. We yeah. don't ever have to clean them. Mother Nature kind of does that for us. Um, but when you do need to clean them, it's really getting out there with a the brush, dipping in the water and, and scrubbing the array. 
if the water is not, you know, if it's a wastewater and, and you don't want to use that type, then you'd bring out some type of tank as well to do it. But for the most part, we, we really don't see that as a, as a major need. It, it stays pretty clean. I mean, you think about a ground system being on grass and dirt. And so there's a lot of things that are getting picked up and, and kind of blown onto the panels where when you're over a body of water, you just don't, you don't see that type of, uh, you know, a dirtiness. Sure, sure. I understand that. And a um, couple more questions here for you, and then we'll switch over uh, to Josh. Um, how easily can the system be moved around if a tank needs to be taken out of service? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a great question. We, we get that one a lot. So mm. because it's floating, that's one of the nicest things about it. Um, you're able to just uh, disconnect the mooring lines, float it to the other side of the uh, of the reservoir, do whatever work you need to do on that side, and then move it back. A lot of times when we build it, we, we might not even build it on, on the bank closest to where it's going to be housed, right? Because we're going to build it on, on where maybe there's more area, storage area, things like that. So then we're able to float it across the reservoir. Um, but we've, we've seen that with, with some of our projects where they need to you know, dredge the bottom of the pond every couple of uh -huh. years. And it's the same concept where they would just move it out of the way and then move it back once they're complete with the work. That's great. And then um, last question, then we'll, we'll switch over here. With facilities that have these panels and systems installed, um, is the, how is the electricity generated tied into the plant or the grid? Is it through the plant's control rooms? Do you have a panel outside of the plant? Um, like how does that interconnection work? Yeah, and that, that's very customized to the site because mm -hmm. uh, each one, as you can imagine, is very different and unique. For the most part, what I like to make sure people understand is that you're still tied to the grid. So mm -hmm. what we do is we go through the, uh, the uh, utility there, and mm -hmm. then you essentially do what they call a bi-directional meter. So whether mm -hmm. you're pulling from the solar or pulling from the grid, the water plant doesn't ever see the difference. It's mm -hmm. just that when they're overproducing or or should I say over consuming their power than what the solar is producing, then they'll pull from the grid and then in, and vice versa at night and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we look in, in, in terms of the interconnection, that side of it is just like any type of solar install. So like once you get to land, all of those same principles apply for, for any type of solar. It wouldn't be any different for floating. Great. And my last question, I know this is a question in the chat, but I have one. Um, does this system qualify for you know, the federal tax credit. I know we have some uh, solar renewable energy credit payment uh, from the uh, from the state. Yes. Does this type of system uh, apply to all of those different types of incentives as a normal system would that is ground mount or roof mount? Absolutely. Okay. All of those same incentives apply. And the really neat thing on the Inflation Reduction Act that was signed in the law uh, last year, mm -hmm. there's a 10% domestic content adder and so for most ground systems, that's pretty difficult to do because 40% of the components have to be from the U.S. and 100% of the steel has to be from the U.S., which makes these projects a lot more expensive. Mm. For floating, we don't have any steel. So we get to avoid that requirement. And then 40% of our components, we hit that alone with just the floating system being here, made here in the U.S. So we're actually looking at a 10% additional. So we're at, at up to 40%. Oh. You can now capture... Uh, dollar for dollar. And then the other side of the Inflation Reduction Act is really cool is that they made it a direct pay provision for non-taxable entities. So yeah. in the past, no one else was able to capture those incentives. Now non-taxable entities can capture those same incentives at 40%. So essentially you're getting a 40% rebate on whatever you spend on solar in year one. So it's, it's, it's a really big deal. That's really great. Yeah, I love the fact that they allowed or, left, or lifted that restriction for non-taxable entities. It makes it so much more accessible if a municipality wants to um, take a lead on a project and not have to go through other folks to procure those um, incentives. Yeah. And then cool. for the most part, we could do what we call a power purchase agreement, which most people on, on this call are probably familiar with. So we've yeah. done that for all three projects in Ohio. We're doing a power purchase agreement. Um, and then, you know, they're able to capture the tax incentives and then pretty much share that savings to the end user in the form of a cheaper cost of power. Great. Great. Well, thanks, Stetson. Uh, we'll see if any more questions come in for you. I know I just, we had a laundry list, so I wanted to get through those. Uh, but Josh, I'm going to switch over to you. We've got some questions about your, your uh, wetland system. So, I think you might have touched on this, but if you can kind of re reiterate, um, you know, how the nutrient removal 
efficiency. What's it like uh, during cold weather? So during cold weather, yeah, it's it tends to go away um, as long as the the uh, cells aren't frozen. You do get a little bit, um, but it drops down to about twenty percent. Um, mm. There is just some going on biological activity. Uh, really, it comes down to then the detention time. I think plays a big part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, similar if you're running a activated sludge and your sludge age kind of thing, but it's just a little different with your um, your wetlands. So yeah, it does drop off. So usually by um, when we did a lot of mon we did some intensive monitoring for a couple of years. We once we saw it drop off like right around um, like in central Illinois or early December, we just stopped and noticed it really wasn't doing a whole lot for us. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Another question for you, what is the, what was your rationale for incorporating a wetland when maybe tertiary filtration is already in place? Um, why, why add the wetland? Uh, I think a lot of it was just to uh, uh, do some treatment for phosphorus. Um, and then get the nitrate reduction. We already, our plant does operate really well. We get really low ammonias. We have low solids. Um, but it was, I think at the time, um, make it more acceptable for the public too. Um, when we built the plant, I'll just say, hey, we're, we're putting in some natural systems here. Uh, and I, this was a little bit before my time uh, when it did go in. So you're <laughs> stretching some of my knowledge of it. But uh, even at our, so this is our second plant, um, our main plant, our west plant uh, that we have in Bloomington. We did even uh, do some experimental wetlands. We built a small, I don't know, maybe half acre size wetland there uh, and just experimented with, with how we would uh, operate that. So I think it was just more of bringing that pilot project to fruition and uh, knowing that it would have uh, additional benefits besides just uh, the nutrient treatment with uh, wildlife uh, enhancement. Sure, and I love that aspect. I know there was a question in the chat about, you know, is the wetland open to the public? And you said yes, which is such a great attribute to have um, in the community. It not only, it has dual function, you know, more nature, more habitat, and then also just public education too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we've uh, been in contact uh, multiple times with uh, members of the Audubon Society. Mm. I'm trying to sometimes, uh, as of late, you know, I've been coordinating with them um, sometimes on the levels we operate uh, the wetlands at, yeah. uh, knowing that uh, their efficiencies um, kind of taper off in the fall. Uh, one angle we've been taking is trying to lower the water levels a little bit earlier because there are shorebirds that'll want to come in. Uh, and then if we have a little bit of an exposed bank, that'll attract them. So it kind of like, well, if we're not really getting as much treatment, where else can we benefit the environment from? Mm. So it is pretty neat, yeah. Yeah, I've just learned a lot about water levels and different sorts of birds and migration patterns um, recently. So that's really interesting that you're able to partner with natural or organizations like Audubon Society on those types of initiatives too for wildlife. Um, we do have a question related to DMRs. Um, do, you, do you have your DMRs at um, the plant discharge or at the wetland discharge for your system? At the plant discharge. Gotcha. That is where it is at. Um, it, I think it would be pretty difficult to have it uh, at the uh, wetland discharges to the, the nature of them um, and consistency of flow through them uh, seasonally. So mm -hmm. it was strictly more of a, let's see what we can do with, uh, with our effluent, really. How can we improve it? Um, I know there's kind of always been in the back of our mind, um, could we use it, you know, would, what benefit would it be to have, you know, that included kind of in the, in the permit, but um, I don't think it's uh, a reliable enough for us to completely tie ourselves to it, uh, per se. And then, like I said earlier, you know, we're working on the uh, nutrient removal upgrade uh, for phosphorus. So that will kind of pick up a lot of that. Um, That's great. Inner effluent. Cool. I did have a follow-up question too. Um, question about pests. Uh, you talked about the muskrats a little bit, but uh, okay. 
more like mosquitoes and insects and things. Any issues with those out there that you've been aware um, of or kind of natural processes? Really, the of? yeah, mosquitoes aren't really too much of a problem. Uh, if anything, that's a problem out there is ticks. You get a lot of ticks, so be aware. Uh, that's one thing I've learned. Um, but yeah, really, the insects are not too bad. I, I think um, we've got a probably a good balance of uh, of uh, predators for them out there, probably to keep it down. There might be a week or two where you might get a little bit more, but it's not too terrible. I've seen a lot worse. So. Great. All right, looks like we've gone through our questions. Does anybody have any more questions for either of our speakers? I was so excited to hear about both. These are really unique ways of approaching resilience at, at plants. And there's so many different application types for the floating solar and looking at different wetlands as options for nutrient removal and nature. And it's just really interesting. So thank you both for presenting. Um, I'll give it a little bit more time. It looks like we don't have any more questions coming through. Sean, do you have any final questions for our panelists? I don't see any have come through either in the chat. I think we've covered everything. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here today. To all of our attendees, uh, we had a great crowd today to talk about resilience measures. Again, um, this session is recorded. I'll send this out with our uh, presentation slides here in the next day or so. Um, and uh, CEUs are on their way. Thank you so much, Stetson and Josh, for joining us today and taking time to share your expertise with all of Illinois operators all across the state. So thank you so much for your time. And if anybody has any questions for these two presenters or wants to follow up, please feel free to email me and I'll get you connected. Yep. Great. Thank great. you so think, much. Have a great day, everybody. I did have one more just oh. before we go. Uh, uh, for the solar systems, have you installed any that are battery backups or they're standalone systems? We have, yes. The one I referenced earlier at uh, Fort Bragg for, for the Army, it had a two megawatt hour Tesla battery as well attached to it. So that is definitely something we can we can explore. Oh, great. Cool. Well, our next session will be March 14th, and it's going to be talking about variable frequency drives for water treatment plants. And then our final session uh, will be April 25th, and we'll talk about I&I and, &I and the impacts of energy on your plant. So stay tuned. You'll get all of those through email as well. So thanks, everybody. Thank you again to our speakers, and have a wonderful afternoon. We'll talk soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>